Generative design mimics the way nature, uh, nature's evolutionary design process um, in the way that it starts with a designer putting in some information into the system, into the computer. That would be things like case load, how much does it need to, uh, how much stress it needs to take, how much does it need to weigh, what materials do we need to use, what manufacturing methods have we got available to us. To us. All that information goes in at the start of the process, then the computer using the power of the cloud comes up with hundreds, maybe thousands of different iterations. Uh, and the clever thing with this is every iteration that's created by the computer then goes back into a feedback loop, so it learns from the designs that it has created, feeds them back into the iteration, and then it builds on and improves again. So you're left with lots and lots and lots of different um, design iterations, then the design engineer comes back into the uh, design process and, and carries that forward. As a bit of an introduction to generative, um, the, the typical way in which we would design something, in this case here, let's say a chair. Um, you design the chair, you, I've got the idea in my head, I know what I want, I'm basically documenting that on a computer. Um, I'm happy with how it looks. I'd probably take it to the next stage where I put some finite element analysis on there. So I, what I would do is I would test that. Is it going to take the weight of the average human or the 97th percentile or whatever it is we're measuring there? If not, I would iterate that myself. I'd go back in, I'd make some changes, uh, reduce some material, add some material, change the shape. Um, but with generative design, having put all the parameters in place, for example, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner there, where, uh, how, what material, what machines we've got available to us, uh, the computer, using the power of the cloud, can generate all these ideas for us, and after all these ideas have been created, the design engineer can go in and can like say, right, actually, I, I want this to be stackable, so let me focus on those, those designs. Actually, I want this to be made from, from titanium, so let's look at those designs and refine there. So what it does is it cuts out that iterative part for the designer, and it certainly isn't replacing the designer or the engineer. I very much think, um, and this is the way it's been used with students, is it's augmenting that process, so we've got a computer and a student working together. So what were we sort of seeing there when there was those chairs were flashing by? Is that just the many different iterations that the process is going yeah, through? Or? Absolutely. So each one of those is an iteration. And the key thing to remember there is that feedback loop. So every time it creates an iteration, it learns from how it can be improved. That information goes back into the system so that the next iteration to come out is that little bit better. And then what we can then do is we can, we can refine that as we go along. But yeah, uh, the, the, the real, the real uh, advantage here is using the cloud. Um, and that comes back to the disruptive times that we're in. Uh, we call it the future of making things where we've got a convergence of lots of technology, uh, cloud computing, new ways of manufacturing things, consumers' demand changing, and the things that they want from product all coming together to be able to, to give us the power there via the cloud, which we wouldn't have been able to do this before on a, on a normal desktop computer. And, and that chair, I guess, looks kind of like a chair, but also there are some differences. Yeah, it looks so, kind of skeletal. You know, that chair, the, the key thing with this is obviously we want to be able to, to make it. Um, and this is the output of, of that chair. This is, this is the, 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 what we call the elbow chair. Uh, but that's actually been manufactured um, which, Why is it called the elbow chair? I, I don't know the reason for it being <laughs> on the elbow chair. I don't use part of our, our body, but the, the, I think the key thing, well, if you look at that 10 years ago, you, that, that would like be something from a science fiction movie. Um, and what's happened there is because we've got the convergence of the cloud, new technologies like generative coming uh, onto the scene, and then we've got things like robotic arms being able to hold a, uh, a router on the end and being able to get into places which wouldn't have ordinarily been able to manufacture, we end up with products like this and it's nice that this is made from, from wood to perhaps represent that uh, organic um, yeah, homegrown shape. Because actually in, intuitively looking at that, and maybe it's because I'm prejudiced from the fact that I have this preconceived idea of what a chair should be in my head, it almost looks like I haven't got very much back support with that chair for example. It's like, I guess it just shows you how different... Absolutely and, and, and that's a really really interesting point because this is where you know computers don't have emotions, they can't see things, they can't see aesthetics that, that me and you can see. Um, so this is where working with a designer is, is as important. Now we'll see a little bit later, but uh, the designer in, has, has quite a lot of, of control at the start of the process. So they can say, well actually I, I do need material in this place 
for a backrest, for example, I do need material in this place, so obviously I'm not going to fall through. Uh, you know, I need to sit on that surface. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, obviously, in this case, we've got four legs, which does represent um, how a typical chair so, might So it's know. possible that the computer could decide that actually you don't need something underneath uh, yeah, to hold you up. <laughs> this is why it's critical that the designer <laughs> yeah. or the engineer has that information. Uh, if, if, it's, if you don't tell the computer enough, the computer won't know what you're trying to achieve. Uh, so there's a different skill there. There's a skill shift from actually, rather than CAD, where computer-aided design, you had the idea in your head and then you transferred that onto a computer. Think of CAD as not as computer-aided design, but computer as designer. Mm. Um, and what's really important there is if you want the computer to be a designer, you need to give the computer the information it needs to design something. Because obviously CAD is a, a term and a concept that's been around Absolutely. Many years. Yeah, and this is moving beyond that. Mm. Um, this is what uh, I would consider an advanced design and manufacturing tool um, because design and manufacture themselves are converging and they're coming together. And if you've got good enough information at the start of the process, in the design process, for example, here, um, you can manufacture anything. And how, so how are students actually tackling this then? Yeah, so every time I talk to, to students, there's exactly that, the wow factor with the circular economy. There's three things that students get really empowered by um, and excited. That's circular economy, that is generative design, and it's uh, user-centered design as well, which is, they're the three things that I'm really seeing students get excited about. Um, and I wanted to talk to you, first of all, about a, uh, a student over in Germany. This is uh, Philipp Manger, who's at the uh, University of Applied Science in Jena. And what he's done here, this is what we'd call our first level of, of generative design. So it's not generative as we've just spoke about, but it's a great introduction to what students are doing now with tools that are completely free to them. Um, and what he's done is he's used something called topology optimization. Topology optimization. Yeah, it's a nice, nice easy <laughs> one there to remember. What does that actually mean? So topology optimization is the fundamental principle under, under generative in, in, a, in a kind of way. What you would do here is you would say, right, I need um, some five millimeter axles uh, to hold the wheels. I need four mounting holes on the bottom of the, of the skateboard in this instance. And then everything else is up for grabs. And effectively what it does is it works out exactly where the forces are gonna be with all those parameters that the designer has put in. And then what Philip will do there is augment that, and he's worked with the computer to be able to come up with this organic shape. Now there's just one, and Philip's in complete control of those iterations. It's up to him whether he goes back and goes through that process over and over again, not the computer. But also what he's done as well is he's used them tools, and you can probably see just inside there the lattices. So this is a product called Netfab, and what he's done there is very, very similar to how our bones are made. Our bones grow, not made. Um, if, we were so, if we were solid bones, we'd evolved over time, right? We'd be very inefficient. We'd be dragging ourselves around. We wouldn't be uh, very agile. Made that hollow. Some of us still aren't, Steve. Uh, absolutely, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's made it hollow. So there's parts in there, them, them lattices are less than a millimeter in, in, in diameter. And that then adds that strength and, and back to biomimicry replicates exactly how we as humans and animals have evolved. One step towards generative design. Yep. And there are, I guess there's examples of students who've, or projects where it's gone a step further. Yeah, so I just want to show you the next one. So this is actually something which is fresh this week and we've got a program in the UK for secondary schools actually uh, called Engineers, where we get students to use digital tools to design and 3D print a quadcopter, a drone. Um, again, glad you said it was a drone. Glad you said <laughs> actually at the moment that diagram means very little to yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> and this is this is where we completely flipped the design process. It's quite interesting. So on there, um, what you've got is you've got the red areas which we we need to preserve. So we need them red areas need not have any material in there. You can see you've got multiple arrows in there where we've got certain forces, and they're going to be there all of the time. So we need to tell the system, in this case Fusion 360, exactly where those forces are going to be. When you say forces, what's that, like air pressure? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the natural... It could be from when the drone's landing and yeah. the force of its own structure. It could be, you know, the fluid di dynamics of that air coming through. All of those need to go in, in, into, this, uh, into this study here. Uh, the red areas are where we've got things like propellers and blades. You know, we, we can't have material there, otherwise that can't Get circulate and move. And then and when we've got the green area, 
where we, we need material there because that might be regulation, um, depending on, on what it is. And we put all that in, and then what comes out is this. So this Another is... skeletal type uh, <laughs> structures to you. Yeah, it, it looks like... I mean, I look at that and I think, obviously, I can't see how it could be an animal, but if you look at how bones, when you look at a bone, it just looks so similar to that. And that's that idea of, you know, form follows forces. It's looked at the forces and it looks at where it needs to have material and then it's created that drone quadcopter chassis there. It's kind of like nature meets the world of future technology, it's, isn't it? it Absolutely, and you know that idea of biomimicry and, and learning from nature to take us into this next generation of design. What, is going to be what are the advantages of this particular design? Okay, so this design actually is a lot, a lot, a lot lighter than a. It's difficult. So what we've got is first of all, you would design and make something. We call it parametrically. So you would create, and you th right. I think I need that much material, and you put it under a loan. What, what's happening here is because. Uh, the computer has been left to design this using the principles of nature. It's come up with something where it just needs the amount of material that it has. So it doesn't need any more, doesn't need any less. You can change the parameters, so the aesthetics, for example, and that quadcopter may well uh, need to slot in with another quadcopter. Um, but, but ultimately, what we've got is we've got a lightweight reduction there, hugely lightweight, and then we've also got something that's potentially um, a lot stronger and a lot more mechanically fit for purpose uh, than what something designed in a traditional design process would have been. And I guess it's just, it's just not, without the support of this sort of technology and this big data, mm -hmm. it must be extremely hard for a designer to just think this up, or, you know, even to get that far to really radically innovate in this way. Definitely, and I think the key thing here is the data acquisition. Um, so this is really early stages and this is data uh, which Mark Chester, who we've been working with at Autodesk um, to produce this program, has, has got himself. Obviously, with quality sensors, if we operated this drone and put sensors on this and we were having real time data coming back into the system, then that's going to create that agile product development system. We can use that data and we can improve that on the next iteration as well. And you can just see along the bottom the different types of iterations of where we start. Each time that gets better, because generative design cross-references the previous design to learn from it and improve. So what we're seeing on the bottom there is a pro progression from this to what we see in, at the top. Absolutely. That actually feeds into a question that we've had from uh, uh, Eves, uh, who, who actually was sort of asking about this, is could you please explain how the feedback on each iteration is given to the complete computer cloud system? Is it based on AI? Which I guess you're kind of saying the, 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 data, this, the technology is giving the feedback Absolutely. We're giving yeah. feedback to it. So, so what's happening there is each time um, a iteration has been created, uh, it's effectively doing that analysis of those stresses and strains. So the loads that the engineer predefined, it's running that analysis on that particular uh, iteration, and then that's feeding it back into the system. And we're doing some really cool stuff at Autodesk with AI. Um, and one of the things with doing with AI is how robots can have uh, eyes and sensors and thermal sensors and that type of thing to, to improve manufacture. So wouldn't it be cool if you could, um, with machine learning, a robot could start 3D printing or building something but then know through its eyes that it was going a little bit wrong, that the thermal camera eye said that it's cooling a little bit too quickly so it needs to respond and, and that's the sort of stuff they were doing with machine learning. That uh, sounds like a really another really quite big step towards this sort of technological future that we're often discussing. Um, kind of comes back to your, the point you're making um, earlier about uh, the role, what it does to the role of designer in, in the world where you've got this technology thing. I think it's there's also like a kind of link thought to that of like um, what sort of comes first, the, the mindset shift and what you're looking for and, or, or the potential that you just realise that this technology can do something crazy and let's have a play with it. Yeah, I think this is, this is why it's really interesting working with students because this technology is new. <coughs> um, things like additive manufacturing are new. The idea of robots being able to make things is, is new and it's all happened in this generation where we've got students coming through the system. And the answer to that is these students are using this and they're exploring and they themselves are coming up with these answers. You know, they're answering these questions. 
Um, so I was speaking to some students up in, up in Manchester um, a couple of weeks ago, you know, and fair enough, we've got a, a computer designing things, which is, which is great, but I would always, you know, are the robots coming to take over our jobs? I would say absolutely not. Um, but I would say working with robots, working with computers, and the human with that emotion, um, all augmented together, is certainly for me where the future of making things um, is going gonna, is gonna to go.